I think we should start, and um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Eric Wieschaus as our speaker for today. Um, I should probably uh, keep that very short because you would probably um, like to hear Eric rather than me speaking. Um, I can give you a, a very short introduction into what um, Eric has, uh, you know, um, in, in Eric's CV, he has uh, studied in um, Notre Dame, in uh, University of Notre Dame in, in, in the US. Then he did uh, his, uh, um, his PhD at Yale University and he moved on to Basel to do his postdoc work there. And from Basel he moved to the EMBL, probably most of you know it, in Heidelberg. And there he did uh, his great work together with um, Janni Nisslein on gene regulation in Drosophila uh, embryonic development, for which uh, he was uh, um, awarded the Nobel Prize in 95, 96, 95. 95, together with uh, Janni Nusslein and uh, Ed Lewis. Perhaps um, I can just say two things about Eric, which I particularly um, appreciate and I really admire, is um, Eric um, spent, you know, I should say that after EMBL actually moved to Princeton and spent all his time in Princeton. What I um, really like about Eric is that he um, did all his life what he can do best, and that is being a scientist and doing research, and he didn't really move into politics or anything else. He's just still on the bench and he's doing experiments and you know that's what he uh, what he's brilliant in. Um, and the other thing is, you know, and I, I can just say that he really, uh, after you know after EMBL, he took on a very hard problem in biology and that is uh, sort of understanding how this gene regulatory pathways translate into morphogenesis of the embryo. And um, at the time when you started doing that, that was really difficult, I think. Now, due to uh, modern techniques and microscopy and so on, things have got much easier. But uh, when, whenever there was sort of a breakthrough in the morphogenesis field, um, people from Eric's lab were the first, and then many others sort of joined. If you think about, you know, apical oscillatory contractions or flows, and then all that came essentially from, from Eric's lab and, and, um, and sort of con got continued um, with other people in the field. That's all I wanted to say, and um, it's uh, all to you, Eric. Thanks for coming. What you're actually looking at here are uh, human embryos at the moment of fertilization, and during the course of very early human development, you can see that one of the essential problems that an embryo has, uh, the single cell, the first job is essentially for this single cell to divide into, to produce multiple cells. You can see that happening uh, over the course of the first three or four days. The next, by about six days of human development, what you can begin to see is something else, is a, a more complex organization. And by this stage, the embryo is a, a, a hollow ball of cells on the outside, and a tiny little group of, of cells on the inside. So there's already a spatial organization, a distinction of different cell types here. The cells on the outside of this embryo, and actually many of the cells inside, are going to be primarily concerned not with making the embryo itself, but with making the implantation site, the placenta of the embryo in the body of the mother. And it's only after, a, for human embryos, only after about day 14, where a tiny group of cells inside this embryo that forms a flat sheet of cells are actually designated as the embryo. You can see an organization here along the future head to tail axis of the embryo. And then over the, the next 12 days or so, this form this initial simple organization, assumes that a more and more complex organization, this will be the head of the embryo. You can see the, the spinal column of the embryo forming here, an increasingly complex organization that we can begin to associate with our own bodies. That process, fundamental process, is and remains for, I think, for all of us, extraordinarily is mysterious. How is it possible that this single, apparently simple cell gives rise to something as complex as us? <laughs> 
How are different cells in the embryo directed to different cell types? Obviously, you have muscle, skin. It's not just enough for the embryo to divide and to make a spatial organization, but those cells have to become different, and they have to become different in an ordered, patterned way. What are the forces that shape the simple cell into a complicated structure? And where does the pattern come from? We know that these are biological questions about the biology, but we also know that almost, and we also know that almost everything, that almost everything, everything in biology, directly or indirectly, is reflected in the patterns of gene activity that occur during embryos. And so one of the ways to think about the process of development is to think of it in terms of patterns, not of visual patterns of cells and positions, but in terms of patterns of gene activity. And if we can understand those patterns and extrapolate from the gene activity back to the mechanical forces, then we're in a good position, perhaps for the first time in biology, to actually understand the process of embryonic development. Now, what I'd like to do in uh, the lecture today is talk to you about these processes. And as you, you'll, you'll see what addressing these problems in mammalian or, or even in, in, in human embryos is not only scientifically difficult, but experiments on human embryos are ethically uh, problematic. Uh, and human embryonic development is also scientifically, takes a long time for a fertilized egg to develop into a human embryo. So very often in laboratories, we use model organisms. Uh, and the particular organism that I've worked on and throughout all of my scientific career are the embryos that are derived from the fruit fly, uh, the classic genetic system. And one of the big advantages is shown here is that this embryo goes from a fertilized simple egg to a ball of cells in about three hours and that immediately undergoes morphological transformations. This will be the head. This is the long axis of the embryo. And this turns into a complicated larval form with a brain and behaviors. And it does this in 20 hours. And I should say, it does this 20 hours is faster than a human embryo undergoes its first cell division. So this fly embryo does extraordinary, the complete and complex process of development that we can follow and uh, much more rapidly. But also, because fly embryos, <laughs> flies mate and then they produce fertilized embryos that and female, or females fly around and if they find a, a banana or a pleasant, a good piece of fruit, they will lay their embryo outside and that embryo develops outside the body of the mother. That means that it's very easy to collect fly, fly embryos and to examine them visually. Uh, and so, as you can see here, this is just a picture of a fly embryo during the normal course of development. This is a time-lapse movie. And you can see these extraordinary processes of movement and cell shape. You can label the surfaces of cells with GFP proteins. Oop, and in theory, yeah, follow the behaviors of individual cells. And again, the same movement that looked as flow, we can now begin to understand as shifts of positions of cells in the embryo. You can see individual cells dividing here, perhaps, them in a complex process. And we can also, ah. OK, so the ability to observe in biology is probably some, one of the really central things. Most of my own thoughts come from having sat at a microscope and watched these processes, watched embryos develop. And I think all of you, in looking at those movies, could almost immediately imagine 
forces and flows and processes that would be governing those cell embryos. Uh, now, uh, and all of those things are uniquely possible in looking with fly embryos, and that's a strong argument for if you're interested in embryonic development and how it occurs to work with fly to do this with fly embryos. But it turns out there's even a second and strong, uh, a, a third and, and very strong argument for working with flies is that uh, fly embryos is even though when I was a young student, no one worked on fly embryos, flies were already established as a laboratory organism, and a laboratory organism largely to, to, study, to study heredity and to study genetics. So most of what we know about genetics and the nature of genes and the transmission of genes, organization of genes onto chromosomes, comes from work in Drosophila. And so the critical advantage that flies and working with flies brought to the field of developmental biology and the understanding of embryonic development was the introduction of a genetic understanding of the process. That it wasn't just a matter of looking at cells or transplanting them or thinking about morphogenesis, but that you could also identify the um, genes involved in the process and understand the process in terms of those gene activities. Now, as I mentioned to you, embryo is a very interesting case. Begins by the fertilization of an egg by a sperm. The genotype of the embryo is contributions of both the, the male chromosomes that are provided by the male and by the female. But the cytoplasm of the egg is derived strictly by the mother. And so in terms of thinking about gene activities, we're, there's going to be two different classes of genes that we have to work with. There are going to be genes that are active in the embryo itself. And then there are going to be gene and gene products that the mother contributes to the development of the embryo. My, among my first experiments in working with flies, and these are the experiments that were eventually recognized with the Nobel Prize, set out to identify genes that were involved in embryonic development. But the critical idea, and this was the experiments with Christiana Nusslein Fulhart, was that if one wants to understand a process, the essential feature is to not just to identify certain genes that are relevant, but to identify all genes that are relevant and understand the relative contributions of each of those genes to development. Now, in flies, we know now that there are about 13,000 genes, 13,000 protein encoding regions in the fly genome. If you take embryos, fly embryos, and grind them up and analyze them molecularly, what you find is that somewhere between 7,000 and 8,000 of those genes are expressed as RNAs in the embryo. What Yanni Nusslein and I wanted to figure out was how many of those genes that are RNAs or gene products that are present in the embryo are essential for the normal development of the embryo, how many of those genes, how many of the genes are, that are transcribed in the embryo are essential for the embryo to develop and hatch as a larva. And what we found is that, uh, this is the first important result, is that even we did mutagenesis experiments where we treated flies randomly with mutagen and randomly knocked out each gene, each of the 13,000 genes four or five times and then assayed the effects. And what we found was that even though most of the genes, uh, were, many genes were expressed in the embryo, there were only really about one out of you know, about a thousand genes whose ex uh, presence in the embryo is actually required. And that if we, actually even more interestingly, if we looked at what happened when those genes 
were eliminated, there were only 120 genes that were essential for anything that we could see in the embryo, normal morphology. Because we had done the, the experiment at such a scale that we had actually knocked out every gene many times, what we had was the first complete genetic description of an organism in a process. So the interesting thing here is that we now, with flies, and I think this is still uniquely true for flies, that we know from the standpoint of embryonic development the relevance of each of these genes. And the, just looking at these numbers, there's one other conclusion that's possible to, that it's possible to make of this. Essentially, although many genes are expressed in the embryo and useful in the embryo, only a small fraction of these genes are supplied by the embryo's own transcription. And that means that most of the gene products that an embryo receives and needs or uses it derives from its mother and are present in the egg. So we can summarize that in the general, whoop. Ah, yeah. A general view is that most RNAs, everything that you know about from the cell biology, are supplied as RNAs or proteins in the embryo. So things like ribosomal component transcription translation, all of the machinery of life are supplied in the egg and are present there. The mother supplies those gene products, makes them available, and the embryo itself can make its own gene products. But the critical idea that came from these experiments was that the number of, of uh, transcriptionally required genes is very small, 120. And that if you look at the products of those genes, what you see is uh, this, uh, this central idea is that the embryo, these 120 genes, are the genes that the embryo could not supply by the mother. You say, what? If the mother could, if a gene is just needed, you would supply it by the mother and have it, the gene product of that protein in the egg. But the special thing that transcription in the embryo gives you is the opportunity to put a gene in one place and not in another, in one cell and not in another. If the, if, if the presence or if the, of a gene product is just needed, you could have it in all cells, but only some cells would, would use it. But if the presence of the gene and the absence of the gene have equal meaning, then the pattern of gene expression and the timing of gene expression becomes very essential. And what that means, when we looked at the 120 genes, what you can see is that these, the embryo uses zygotic gene expression, transcription, to put genes in one place and to not put them in the other place. So effectively, these, even though we were looking at genes that who, which were supplied by transcription in the embryo and characterizing all, and found that only 120 genes were essential for transcription, the critical thing, the thing that we didn't really understand is that by looking at transcriptionally supplied genes, what we were actually looking at is defining the switch points in development, the cases where the presence and the absence of genes have meaning, meaning that a self-choice was dependent on the activation of that gene versus another gene. So in a way, what that tells us is that, excitingly, there is 120 switch points, 120 decisions or uh, decision modules that have to be made. Now, many of these genes are used, it's not quite a correct formulation, because many of these genes are used at several points. But the use of these genes and their zygotic transcription is essentially the mode for making decisions in the embryo. 
for choosing cell fates. Correspondingly, almost all of them are transcription factors or signaling molecules that control transcription factors. And you can look at their patterns in a particularly interesting case where sets of genes which were expressed in patterns along the anterior posterior axis and were, whose activities were required to form certain structures of the adult, or of the, the larval body. So a, a gene like uh, the Krupal gene here was required in the thorax and anterior abdomen. A gene like orthodentical or OTD was required in the brain in the head. And these genes, the expression of these genes, define cell choices. But interestingly, and this was the second important idea, the expression of these genes were not really related to specific cell types, but to, uh, uh, they're related to more to specific positions. So we can see that there are genes along the anterior posterior axis. There are also genes that are expressed and act as switch points along the dorsal ventral axis. You can combine these expression patterns, and we know that by the time, by three hours of development, we have 6,000 cells, you have a grid of expressions of gene products that define position along the anterior, posterior, and dorsal ventral axes, essentially, that give you, if you will, something like a map where these individual combinations of gene expression positions define coordinates along these two axes. And it's the positions or the coordinates which is the first step in making pattern. Each of these genes are master regulators. They are themselves transcription factors that control uh, development, but they, the first step is to define position and then downstream of any particular position is an appropriate set of cell responses that might be diverse, might be skin and brain or combinations, but that the essential first step is position. And this gives us a sense of the logical structure of development. The first step is to define position along the, uh, along the uh, axes of the embryo. But so far, I have to remind you, these are genes which are transcribed in the embryo itself. Each individual cell has the capacity of expressing any gene, and yet a particular gene is expressed only in a particular stripe or a particular region of the embryo. And so the, it's not obvious from these genes, which are essentially response genes, how this, where this pattern comes from. And one possibility is that patterns are present in the egg cytoplasm prior to fertilization. This is an patterns, remember, uh, that the egg is large, and a pattern could arise, and embryologists had speculated on this for many, that the pattern of the embryo could reflect some underlying expression, some underlying distribution, spatial distribution in the cytoplasm of the egg. And uh, to identify what those positional inputs might be, it's possible to carry out, again, more genetics with the idea that here, the phenotypes of the mutations would not affect directly the embryo themselves, but the genotype would, you would see a phenotype or an effect in the embryo when the mother was mutant and failed to supply particular uh, components. And what we can think of now is the system is an input-output system that the input information is supplied by molecules that are distributed in the egg cytoplasm, and the output is the transcriptional responses of cells in the embryo. The difference in the genetics is that here, uh, the phenotypes will show up when, only when the mother is mutant. And because this is Drosophila, we can ask through, go through the entire genome 
and ask, are there genes which are essential for providing the spatial information in the cytoplasm? And there are about 20 such genes, about eight affecting the dorsal ventral pattern and about 12 affecting the anterior posterior pattern. And they can be grouped into uh, smaller groups depending on what elements of the pattern are suggested. The typical, one of the most interesting examples is a gene called bicoid, which is for, for historical reasons, flies, mother, maternal flies make eggs in which the bicoid RNA, unlike almost all the other RNAs that the mother supplies in the egg, which would be uniform throughout the whole egg cytoplasm, this bicoid RNA is only localized at the anterior, the future anterior end of the egg. This egg is made then with a cytoplasmic pattern, a distribution of RNAs. The, when the egg is fertilized, the bicoid RNA is translated into a protein, and individual cells in the embryo know where they are by measuring the levels and concentrations of this protein. There are also maternal gradients that define the, the dorsal ventral pattern. And again, the maternal gradients, the concentration gradients, define position along the two axes that activate gene expression in these two domains. The simple way of thinking about it is that uh, you can draw out the distribution or the concentration of this bicoid protein in the egg, and you can imagine that a gene like OTD has a sensitivity to the protein such that the gene is only activated or makes RNA when bicoid concentration is above a particular level. And that concentration that arises because something about the control region of the OTD gene is able, uh, bicoid protein is able to bind it at high concentrations, but not in low concentrations. That's the basic model we've worked with, and that individual genes that are expressed in different points along the anterior post, along this axis of the embryo are sensitive to different concentrations. So simply by reading the concentration, you can establish patterns. We know from genetic studies that these maternal gradients, of which there are three, we can remove uh, that they are essential, and more importantly, that they are, the, we, they are the only components. So that if you remove any one of these maternal gradients, the embryo shows only a part of the normal pattern. But if you remove all three, the embryo ends up as a, a ball with no pattern at all. So this tells us that these, that, that we, in Drosophila and uniquely in Drosophila, we know all the components, we know the input, and we know the, res uh, the response. The interesting thing that we've come to realize, and this talk, I, I'm, um, I should say, I struggled a little bit in trying to anticipate the audience for this talk and the, uh, the, the, the ranges of background here. And so uh, there, this is going to be a mixture of, of the interesting, extraordinary advances over the past 20 or 30 years historical summary, plus the thing that I did yesterday in the lab that is the most exciting thing. <laughs> so we're going to be switching back and forth. Um, and what I've also decided to do is to switch back and forth between talking about flies and then trying to go back to human development and asking how applicable are the conclusions of human development uh, for uh, applicable conclusions of fly development. So this is actually, this is my experiment. I, I work at the bench four hours a day. Uh, and one of the things that we're interested in is if we plot out the distribution of a particular protein, the bicoid protein that you can see here. And we argue that genes are sensitive 
to those concentrations such that they're activated at defined thresholds, if the, this gradient on its own is sufficient to pattern this much of the embryo, what that requires is that if you look at the shape of the gradient, it's easy to imagine how a cell that was sitting here could tell the difference, it, it, tell that it was here and not here, because there are big differences in the concentration. The differences between adjacent cells, though, is like 15%. So we require that cells can measure concentration differences at 15%. We have trouble in the lab doing that. And yet individual cells are able to measure and make choices based on 15%. But it's even more amazing when you get out to this end of the embryo, where the total number of molecules is very small. Because when you, get a, when you have lots of molecules and you're measuring them, you, and you can count them, you can be fairly accurate in your estimate of this, I have 15% more here than I have here. But if, as the number of molecules goes down, trying to use the, your immediate count of how many molecules to distinguish between positions that are only 10 to 15% apart is really hard. And this is, for me, one of the most amazing features of transcription in that early embryos has taught us. That we think of genes coming on and off, and very often we think of the activity of genes, the, the on-off states of genes reflecting on-off states of input. That you input, you supply a maximum, a big change, you turn the lights on, and I start to talk to you. So there's one switch and another. And yet, in biology, the changes that we're asking and this of genes is to measure accurately concentration differences at 15%. I know I'm in this cell and not in this cell because I can measure concentration differences at that level. And those, that measuring of concentration differences occurs on the DNA in regions which we call enhancers or are called control regions which bind specific transcription factors with a defined, with an affinity, a chemical affinity, which is sufficiently distinct such that concentrations of 15% determine whether that gene is going to be active. In experiments that I won't talk to you about uh, in, in uh, this, this lecture, one of the things that we have become very interested in is what's the nature of the information in these enhancers or in these control regions that allow concentration differences to be measured. Is it in the DNA by itself? Or is it in the, some more complicated aspect of DNA structure? or accessibility. To approach these th experiments, what we've done is to isolate a thousand, uh, uh, thousand to five hundred sites in the genome, a thousand to five hundred, five, let's say five hundred genes which bind bicoid with different affinities and drive expression at different points along the anterior posterior axis of the embryo. And then we've taken out that DNA and examined whether pure naked DNA taken out of chromosomes can mimic the same sensitivity and the same concentration dependence as in, their, in their binding that the, that sequence of DNA in the genome, in the nucleus, is able to uh, evidence. And the interesting result is that naked our simple DNA, even if with the appropriate DNA sequences, cannot do this. And that the affinities that we're looking at is something that is built into the more complex chromosomal structure 
of each of these control regions. So I think the most exciting thing <coughs> for us is to begin to try to tease apart and use the embryo to understand what is the features of enhancers and control regions in living intact tissue that allows them, allows those tissues to measure and respond to subtle concentration differences. Ah. Okay, there are varieties of ways. So, uh, now, the first break, I told you what, the story that I've just told you, which is the general description of Drosophila development, is, I believe, one of the great triumphs of experimental embryology in the last 20 to 30 years. I played a role in that, but it's important for you to understand that it was a joint effort of very many labs all over the world, individually looking at individual genes, cloning and characterizing these genes molecularly. But it's one of the, it is an extraordinary accomplishment. We can now step back, though, and say, how applicable is any of this to human development? Uh, the basic features, if you remember, two basic features. Uh, one aspect of mammalian development, which uh, was, was clear very early on, is different from flies, is that, remember I told you that flies make an egg? When female flies make an egg, that egg is fertilized. That egg has RNAs and proteins for almost everything that the embryo needs. The embryo develops rapidly and hatches as a larva with very little growth. Mammalian embryos and human embryos don't work this way. The human egg is very small compared to a fly egg or a frog egg. It, after fertilization, it grows and grows slowly over time. That growth means that mammalian embryos, human embryos, in contrast to fly embryos, are almost totally dependent on their own transcription. The nine months, they, uh, they, even if the egg initially supplies maternal activities, those are very soon not enough. And actually, if you block transcription in a mammalian embryo, it dies within the, the, about the two cell stage. So mammalian embryos build pattern and build uh, and differentiate because they supply gene products that uh, they supply themselves the gene products that uh, they need. Even though the mammalian embryo is developing inside the body of the mother, she's not getting RNA or protein. All that she's getting is nutrition. The second feature is that try as many scientists have, uh, there's no maternal biquid is found in uh, human embryos, no localized RNA of any kind is found in the human egg to set up pattern. No pre-existing maternal patterns, and therefore the current best view is that mammalian embryos in this respect are very different from fly embryos in that they have the capacity to generate pattern on their own, independently of localizations of RNAs. That's still a model because we haven't been able to, no one in working mammalian embryos has been able to demonstrate or describe that self-organization process. But the general consensus in the field is that mouse or mammalian embryos, mouse embryos, probably human embryos, self-organize rather than inheriting an organization from their mother. Now, in spite of that, though, an interesting feature is that many of the genes that would be ex expressed in flies in response to maternal gradients are also expressed in mammalian embryos. In mouse embryos, remember the OTD gene? It's expressed in the head and brain region 
of the fly is expressed in the head and brain region of the early mouse embryo. So the embryo response, the components of transcriptional response in the mammalian embryo are very similar to those in uh, fly embryos. And, the, and these components establish very similar components of the similar elements of the pattern. So if we take the view that um, fly, that mammalian embryos establish pattern by transcriptionally, by some random self-organizing event that then has interacting components, these are the components that are interacting with each other. And the interesting thing for us now is to go back and look at the development of fly embryos and see if we can find subtle indications of the interactions between zygotic components, between transcriptional components in flies that might serve to help refine the pattern and would give us a handle on understanding what potentially happens in mammalian development. Ah, so what I'd like to do though in the last 15 minutes is discuss Another problem, and it's one that has been, uh, has fascinated, I think, as a scientist, how you, what you do and how you end up as a scientist, is, uh, what you, often depends a lot on your own personality and the things that attract you. I am a very visually oriented person. I love looking at patterns of gene expression, but I also just look at, love looking at movement and space. And one of the interesting aspects of development is that even though there are maternal cues that provide positional, uh, uh, positional cues and that embryos respond to these by establishing domains of uh, transcription that control cell fates, what's interesting is the moment the cells enter one of these switch points, choose a particular fate, almost immediately the cell begins to change its shape change its morphology, undergo morphological behaviors that are, uh, so for example, here, these cells in this region of the embryo are going to make what's called mesoderm or future muscle structures. And within 15 to 20 minutes after these genes are fully expressed, the cells on the vent on this side of the embryo begin to buckle into the interior and uh, move, change their physical properties that uh, allow these cells to, to uh, that, uh, that allow the cells to produce more, what we call morphogenetic movements that reshape the embryo. So um, we can follow those processes in uh, scanning embryos. You can see this, uh, these mesodermal cells moving into the interior of the embryo. Again, they are the uh, result of the decisions that cells have made, the transcription factors that come to express uh, cell fates, but what we want to know is how are those transcription factors translated into physical properties that actually control cell behavior? Where do the forces come from? Now, this, yeah. Is a, 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 a struck me as an interesting point. I've told you that pattern in embryos, in fly embryos, comes from some maternal input, some maternal gradients that supply spatial information. And the output, the response to this maternal input, the output are cell fate decisions that are essentially transcriptional. So in terms of pattern, maternal gene products supply the input and transcription is the output. Local transcription is the output. What I'm going to tell you now is that in terms of morphology, in terms of what we can see, the process is almost exactly reversed. Because the morphological changes that occur in the embryo, the local folding or the movement of mesoderm depend on these transcriptional the transcriptional output here, but we're going to take that now as a transcriptional input. 
cell fate decisions. When cells decide to individual fate, the output is to change their shape, to change their, their structure, to change their cell cycle behavior. All of those features depend on proteins that are supplied by the mother. So the cytoskeleton, the adhesive protein, all these are initially supplied by the mother. So here, the input is a cell fate decision in terms of transcription, and the output is the local utilization of maternally supplied proteins. So, uh, this particular pathway, transcription factors called twist and snail, establish mesodermal fate. Oops. We know that these two genes are themselves transcription factors. The decision to be mesoderm means to express twist and snail, and they are transcription factors. They govern the transcription of a number of genes in the mesoderm whose ultimate role is to drive the accumulation, the phosphorylation and accumulation of a protein called my, oops. That's not going. Okay, we'll use yeah. myosin. Okay, you can follow these cells. Uh, accumulation of proteins that drive these cell behaviors. The pathways that are. Uh, very similar to the pathways that drive uh, myosin accumulation in the embryo, in, in mammalian cells. The critical idea, though, here, is that to produce a change in cell shape, if you look at what's happening to these cells, the cells undergo a, cells are long columnar, they undergo an apical constriction, their volumes are constant, and the cells undergo uh, constriction of the apices, the cells elongate and then shorten and are driven into the interior. This constriction of the apices in the cells depends on the accumulation of the change in the distribution of myosin. Myosin, you know, remember, is the, the protein that interacts in your muscle cells to produce contraction. It interacts with the actin cytoskeleton and will produce a contractile force. So acute moving in a cell, moving myosin from this side of the cell to this side of the cell, you can imagine is the local relevant event that drives this cell shape change and this apical constriction. Now, when we looked more closely at this myosin distribution, there were a couple of surprises, and very often surprises in science are the things that you kind of build on. Uh, you can see the outlines of individual cells here, and, and we had assumed initially that if the apical surface of a cell was going to constrict, myosin would be localized in rings around the cell surface such that as the ring constricted, the cell apical surface would constrict it. But what you see is this complicated pattern of a network of myosin that extends over the apical surface of all of these cells. So it's surprising to us, but an even more surprising feature was that if one followed the activity or followed the behavior of this network, what one could see is that if you follow an individual cell here, what you can see is that myosin accumulates in the cell and then is lost, and accumulates in the cell and is lost. Those accumulation patterns are random. As far as we can see, they occur with pulses of about 90 seconds. They're asynchronous between neighboring cells. But the critical thing is if you follow this cell, as the cell undergoes 
accumulates myosin, its A pickles in a pulse. The A pickle surface of the cell reduces. You can maybe see that better. In the next figure, we're going to look at an individual cell. Say, how does myosin how, uh, affect the cell shape change? See the outlines of the cell here. As myosin accumulates over a 45 second period in the cell, you can see that the cell becomes distorted in its shape. And then as myosin is lost and say begins to accumulate in an adjacent cell, the cell returns to its polygonal shape. But this polygon is smaller than this polygon. So it means that morphological changes are stepwise and they're driven by an oscillating machine with a, an average periodicity of about 90 seconds. And we could show by doing cross-correlation analyses that this, these stepwise reductions in apical serve corresponded uh, temporally with an offset of less than three or four seconds to the uh, pulse or accumulation of myosin in those cells. So what this is telling us is at least for one aspect of morphology, we have the motor and the driving, or it, myosin accumulation and myosin pulsing is driving this apical constriction. But there was an interesting observation, an interesting unexpected observation in part, that everything that we looked at in this entire this morphological sequence. Uh, the movement of the nucleus, increase in cell surface area, basal extension, uh, adherence junction morphology. Every one of those morphological changes occurred in a stepwise fashion with a 90 second periodicity and correlated precisely with myosin accumulation in that cell. So, the, ah. And so the, the question, and this is, I think, brings us to a, an interesting point in understanding morphology, and that we have transcription factors that set up pattern. They drive an activation of a single molecule, myosin, that drives a sequence of morphological events that accounts for the morphological transformation. So we have become a, a myosin lab uh, in, the, in a, a reductionist Occam's razor view of the world in that it has become interesting to us to ask a single are there many motors? A complicated uh, life is complicated. Cell biology is complicated. But the thing that we're pushing right now is how much of the morphology, how much of morphological transformation can we explain solely by regulated accumulation of myosin? And this has brought us the lab to a collaboration with the. the um, Boy, Schreiman, uh, Sebastian uh, Streichen, Nicholas Knoll, uh, uh, the Kavli Institute uh, uh, of Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, where we have set out with a kind of ambitious plan to ask, is how, how long will it be acceptable for us to hold on to the Occam's razor of myosin? <laughs> being the sole driver. And the idea of these experiments is to, rather than focusing on any particular organ in the embryo or mesoderm, to take the entire embryo, all cells, all global patterns of distribution, record these, and build what we can think of as a quantitative flow map, that is, how cells in the embryo come to be, uh, undergo redistributions during the process that we call gastrulation. And then simultaneously, 
in these same embryos quantify the distributions, the spatial distributions of myosin and uh, force generating systems in general, but we're going to start with myosin by itself, and then build theoretical models that try to use the myosin distribution, ask to what extent can we use the myosin distributions to quantitatively predict the immediate flow patterns, both the directionality and the magnitude of flows based on uh, myosin uh, discrep uh, discrepancies in myosin. So here you can We're using, we're using light sheet. Well, this is not working, but it's okay. Uh, microscopy to reconstruct the entire surfaces of the embryos, uh, displaying them out into a single 2D pattern, and then plotting at individual minutes the redistributions and flows of uh, patterns. And you can see that three, essentially during these early phases, they're very defined flow patterns and redistributions, and then develop strategies for measuring myosin, measuring all myosin populations in the embryo, myosin populations apically, myosin populations basally, and also taking into consideration that myosin uh, accumulations can be non-polarized, such that a contraction of that myosin would have a, a a uniform, a, a, a uniform effect on all the surrounding cells versus polarized myosin distributions, which would have a, where contraction would have a directionality. And use those values to develop what we can think of as a myosin tensor, essentially a measurement of, at each point on the surface of the embryo of a, a value for myosin. And then ask, uh, the discrepancy or differences between the myosin tensor at individual positions. You have more myosin here. If myosin's the same everywhere, then you're going to have no movement. But if the myosin tensor is different, in theory, uh, the theory is that you will predict stress and tension, and that will result in flow. Now, if you measure myosin, you can make these predictions. Since you don't, you have not measured, you've measured myosin intensity, you haven't measured force, you don't have an actual magnitude of the force difference that's generating the flow. And even if you knew that, you wouldn't be able to predict movement because you don't know the inherent resistance or viscosity of the properties, other properties of the cells in the embryo. But if, the question that we wanted to ask is if one assumes that there is a uniform property over the whole embryo, which is essentially resistance to flow, is the myosin distribution sufficient to predict the flow? So do we have to invoke softening of tissues or uh, uh, changes in adhesion or other properties to describe uh, morpholo morphological change? And, uh, so you can measure the, the distributions, and because we're, I'm going, I will just tell you that yes, it is possible to develop models with a single parameter, constant parameter for resistance, which predict magnitudes of flow that are based solely on myosin distributions that are similar or identical to those actually measured. Uh, in the embryo at any of those moments, you can look, we're at the point now where we're beginning to ask where are the discrepancies. Overall, the model was, were, and the, the, the data allows a prediction with about a 90% accuracy, which is uh, over most periods of time. But there are places like in this period of ventral furrow formation where we can't directly account, uh, simply from the, the initial versions of the model account for this because 
what happens during ventral furrow formation is cells leave the surface. And so we have to incorporate additional, asking what are the features that one must incorporate. Because this is Drosophila, what is exciting is that, and because we can do genetics, we can alter the distributions of myosin in the embryo. We can alter the distributions of cell fates. We can film the embryos and test the model, the, whether a model not only predicts a wild-type gastrulation, but it would predict any variant of gastrulation where we've changed uh, myosin distributions. We can uh, define, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to skip that. OK. Uh, the other things that we're, uh, in addition to these predictive models, they, they've pointed out one of the difficulties that we face is we don't have absolute physical measurements for properties in the embryo. We don't really know the, 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 the the viscosity or resistance of cells. We don't know the elastic properties. And so among the things that we've developed, we're developing our, our tools that involve injections of beads into embryos to um, be able to measure forces, measure resistance, measure elastic lifetimes to ask uh, to what extent uh, when you do work when myosin does work, is that is the energy of that work uh, dissipated simply in flows, or to what extent can some fraction of that work be retained in elastic structures that then impact the next steps in development? What I wanted to do though in the last minute or two was step back again and go to mammalian development, where we have, again, morphological changes that occur and must be driven by changes in the force distributions of molecules. One of the big impacts on mammalian, on understanding mammalian development has come, uh, in human development in particular, has come from the development of in vitro fertilization protocols. So it's possible to follow the development of living embryos uh, and also follow that it, uh, in both uh, in, in humans and in, in mice. The morphological events that occur in early human embryos or mouse embryos are equally, are as, as exciting and remarkable as the ones that occur in fly embryos. It hurts me to say that, but it's true. It's actually true for all embryos. It's one of the wonderful features. Well, the, uh, the interesting questions right now, I think, are the physical activities and physical properties that are involved in forming this hollow blastocyst. There are a set of models that have been uh, uh, around for many, uh, for several years, for 10 to 15 years, that involve uh, essentially pumping water, fluid into, you know, making the outer cells adhe highly adhesive, and then pumping model uh, into uh, the interior to establish a, uh, a, an interior volume. More recently, people have begun to question those models and ask to what extent does the morphological tra uh, uh, these changes are driven by changes within the cells themselves. And it's always the problem with morphology that you can follow and see things, but you, unless you, until you know where the force generating machines are. We, you can't really interpret those processes. It's also possible to, um, okay, to study invertebrate embryos, these later processes of morphogenesis. And I, uh, this is a wonderful image of uh, a vertebrate embryo undergoing this process of gastrulation. If your eyes are very good, you can extract flow patterns and movements of cells that are essentially rather like the same vortex-based patterns of cell movement that we see in other embryos as well. And so the essential questions are, can one extrapolate or build from the, 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 distribution or the, the laws that we've 
learn from a fly morphogenesis to uh, the processes in other uh, in mammalian embryos. I, uh, yeah, just processes in many respects are very similar across all embryos. Okay, so I think the challenge and the goal, I would say for the 21st century, but certainly the goal in my own lab tomorrow, <laughs> is to somehow translate, to come up with a, a deep physical mechanical understanding of the processes that we can see. We know we're driven by gene activities, and we know that those gene activities translate into known cell biological processes but to somehow bridge to the next step, which is the deeper mechanical understanding. I'm going to stop there, just point out that although I work in the lab with my hands four hours a day, every day that I am in Princeton, the reality is that my experiments work sometimes and Sometimes they don't. And four hours a day is actually not enough. The, the true advances, the real advances in my lab and in our ability to push these questions forward have been uh, the wonderful work of my colleagues, the graduate students and postdocs in the lab who, unlike me, work more than four hours a day at the bench. So as credit to tell you guys out there, and we, all, uh, we all know that. I, uh, I'm in the lab mostly because, you know, I've always enjoyed, it's, it's like dogs running through the neighborhood. A whole pack of dogs, and this happens in America, probably not in an organized place like Vienna, but if the dogs are running as a, a pack, you know, the young dogs are out there, and, and the, the old dogs can, uh, you, uh, can will run along, but they're not usually leading the pack. And, uh, but at least they're not sitting up on the porch, looking out, watching the dogs run around the neighborhood. So me, I'm a dog running along with the pack. But the, um, the true work, uh, and I've talked to you about work in my own department, in department in the lab, but I've had wonderful collaborations with the department, uh, uh, yeah, the physics department of the Lewis Siegler Institute at, at Princeton, and then also more recently with uh, uh, the Kavli Institute. So I'll stop there. And if we have time, take questions, whatever, you whatever you'd like. <laughs>